Hello Hillcliff. Lots of love and best wishes from Great Sankey, north of the river. We hope you're all keeping safe and well. We miss our church family and we hope we'll all be together soon. Hello, Hello everybody. everybody. Greetings from the McCullen family. We hope you're all well. And we're looking forward to seeing you all soon. Good morning, Hillcliff. Hi everyone, we're missing you. Hello. Hello. Hi. We miss you all lots. Hope you're keeping well. Won't be long, but we'll see you soon. Hi. Hi. We're missing coffee. So here's one we prepared earlier. Hi, Hillcliff. Miss you, Hillcliff. It's Theo's birthday. Hello. Uh, welcome to the Hillcliff online service. It is the 24th of May. Um, as you heard, it was Theo's birthday yesterday. So happy birthday to you, Theo. And it was also Sam's birthday yesterday as well. So happy birthday to you too, Sam. Do we have any other birthdays? Um, well, if you do, happy birthday to you as well. Um, we're sorry that we haven't been keeping up with the birthdays since going online. Um, we are really missing Steve's gift in that department. Uh, today, Dad will be sharing on praise power prayer. I'll pray for him now, then we will have an intercessory prayers from Linda and Tom before the sermon. Um, we hope you enjoy the service, and if you do, please leave a like down below. Dear Lord, I just um, I pray for Dad now. I just pray that you will lead him as he talks about praying. <laughs> I just I pray that you will bless him and just everybody in our church and everybody around the world. I pray that um, this will touch people's hearts and um, it will help them all. And yeah, just I thank you for you, God, and I thank you that you can be with us in this time and yeah in Jesus name Amen. 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 Dear Lord, uh, we're mindful that it was mental health awareness this week and we pray for um, both patients and staff in the mental health units on our doorstep, Hollins Park, Arbury Court and St Mary's. We pray for those suffering from really debilitating mental illness and for whom the last 10 weeks of social distancing, no visits from family and friends, staff and PPE has been bewildering and frightening. We pray for peace and healing for them and for the continued kindness and compassion of those nursing and caring. In a similar vein, we pray for uh, residents and staff in our local care homes, Somerville, Brampton Lodge, Arlington House. Um, understandably, all the talk of COVID in care homes will be unsettling and worrying. And we pray for protection for the minds of residents and staff there. Also, we pray for the families of residents whose contact for the last 10 weeks has been restricted to waving at and speaking through the window and all the difficult emotion that this brings. We pray for prisoners and staff in our local prisons, Thorncross and Risley. We know that some prisoners are spending 23 hours a day um, locked in their cells uh, during this lockdown period. Uh, we pray against despair for them, Lord, um, that they will be able to see light um, at the end of the tunnel um, perhaps particularly at Thorn Cross where we know of the seeds that Pete and Sean the chaplain have so lovingly sown that faith may fan into flame. We pray for those who are in crisis and have found themselves having to access Warrington Food Bank. Uh, we learned that um, even for the last two weeks of March uh, there was an 81% increase in um, those requiring emergency food and Lord we thank you that charities such as Trussell Trust, Child Poverty Action Group and Step change are battling away to help those in crisis and we pray for practical deliverance for those who find themselves in such need, especially when perhaps at this time more than any other, the challenges to getting back on track can seem overwhelming. And Lord, we pray a blanket prayer over our local community. We yearn for your name to be lifted high and we pray that you can use us to help those around us to journey towards you even at this time. And Lord, we thank you for our church community. You know the myriad needs that there are, Lord, but we just want to give a general prayer of thanks, Lord, that we don't walk this path alone and that within our church family, we've got brothers and sisters rooting for each other and making sure that there's never a time when the altar in your throne room is not fully de decked out with prayers. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for our world right now, the many different countries experiencing this pandemic so differently. We pray particularly for Bangladesh and for India, who are facing a devastating cyclone. We think of people trying to evacuate whilst also maintaining social distancing regulations. We pray for those in refugee camps, 
people who have newly escaped poverty, civil unrest, war and violence. We pray for health infrastructures and camps, we pray for sanitation and we pray for peace. We pray, pray for people across our world who are facing poverty and destitution in different ways. Those who are living in communities where maintaining social distancing is impossible, where housing is limited, where running water doesn't exist. We pray for justice. We pray for people from all over the world who are in marginalised communities, for those who are isolated, vulnerable, oppressed, those experiencing persecution of all kinds, those who feel already forgotten and for whom this is just another challenge that they're having to face. We pray for those living in countries where the leadership is an oppressive regime, who are unable to get access to truthful information, who don't know how to keep themselves safe. Lord God, we pray that you will give us a sense of justice, a sense of peace, a sense of generosity to give our money and our time to charities and organisations who need it most. Would you help us to keep our eyes raised, to keep thinking about countries and places that are far from us, but whose lives are so difficult. We pray that you'll keep uh, people and places close to our hearts and our minds, that we don't just focus on ourselves and our own neighbourhoods, but that we have a global perspective, that we love people across our world just as you love them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Today on our journey in prayer, we're going to look at praise. Um, and um, praise is a, is a priority in prayer, um, which is not only, I think, essential for us to practice, it's also good for us, which I hope you will um, be convinced about if you're not already by the end of, of this talk today. Um, I don't mean necessarily prayers, uh, praise where we where we sing songs of praise, although I certainly want to include that. But I'm talking about prayers of adoration and praise of God as well as songs of adoration and praise. The NIV study describes praise as the joyful thanking and adoring of God and the celebration of his goodness and grace. And I think that's a good um, description of, of how I would understand um, praise. Uh, as well. And uh, as you know already, the Psalms are full of praise, reminders to praise and calls to praise. Um, so for example, in Psalm 103, um, the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. And um, so that's a personal reminder for the psalmist to pray. Also Psalm 100, um, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. That's, to, that's a call that's going out to the whole world. Um, know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us. Um, and so the call for the people of God is to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. That's kind of the stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about praise, prayers of uh, adoration and praise as well as singing um, songs of worship. Um, going back many years to 1998 um, when I was working with UCCF and um, the Universities and Colleges Christian Fellowship I was working at Spring Harvest Word Live and um, I had a group of students that I met with each day from Warwick and Exeter University where we spent time in discussion and in prayer late afternoon of each day after the main teaching and seminars. And uh, as well as discussing stuff, we'd then pray together for a little while at the end. And, and these, these guys, these men and women, were, were good at praying together for themselves, for each other, for exams, stuff that was happening on site at Word Live and so on. Um, one of the days I asked, it was the second day I asked that perhaps today we could focus on what we had learned and enjoyed about God today. Um, and it was one of those kind of tumbleweed moments. There was just silence. Nobody prayed for ages and then somebody prayed a prayer and we had a bit of a discussion about it because it was so awkward um, and one of the guys quite honestly said um, do you mean telling God stuff about himself that I've learned today that he already knows and so it was one of those kind of yeah that's kind of what we mean it was a bit of a puzzled thing 
And he said, well, why, why should we do that? And um, I must admit, I didn't really have any kind of good answer other than that it was in the Bible and we were encouraged to do it and it seemed like a good thing to do. And so we tried it. And I have to say, we tried it each day and that was kind of one of the first things we focused on in our prayer time. And whether I knew why it worked or not, it was good and it was rich. But it did make me think, I don't really understand um, why we do this. And um, and with UCCF, we used to read a lot of stuff from C.S. Lewis. And I recall reading an article many years ago, back then, uh, on praise, um, in which he described his own difficulties in getting his head around and coming to terms with the whole idea of, of praise. And it helped me. I remember that. It really significantly helped me. And I've seen that article referred to many times by authors in books. And the book I was reading, um, I've been reading over the past number of weeks by Tim Keller on prayer, he refers to this article as well. And so I went online and found the article again. And it's part of a book um, of C.S. Lewis's on reflection on the Psalms. And the chapter is called A Word About Praise, which is kind of an article within the book. Um, and he explains that for a number of years after he became a Christian, um, and he became a Christian as, a, as an adult, that he was troubled by the idea of praise. Um, questions like, why are we called to praise God all the time? Why does God seem to demand or command our praise? Why did those who chose to praise him always insist on other people praising him too? And the Psalms he found particularly difficult because it was full of that kind of encouragement to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, let the nations praise him, praise him, dear heavens and bright shining star. And he says, he says this, we all despise the man who demands continued assurance of his own virtue, intelligence or delightfulness. We despise still more the crowd of people around, every dictator, every millionaire, every celebrity who gratify that demand. And what he says is that at that point is spiritual work. He could understand um, obedience to God. He could understand reverence to God. He could understand gratitude to God because of who he is and what he'd done. But he couldn't understand what he saw as God's desire for what he calls perpetual eulogy of praise. That continued expression of admiration and adoration. It was like, what is that all about? And it seemed, well, weird and uncomfortable to him. So he asked the natural questions. Is God vain? The miserable idea, he says, that God should in any sense need or crave for our worship like a vain person wanting compliments. And immediately he says, well, no, look at Jesus, God with us. He's the least Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise mm. Jesus. He is the, the least grasping and vain person, excuse me, ever. And so he asks, um, well, is he insecure, this God? Does he need our praise to somehow complete himself? Something that's lacking in him. Is that why he created us? To, to make him feel better about himself. And he said, well, no, look at Jesus. He is so secure in his identity. Um, he served knowing who he was. If not, then why does he call us to praise him? And C.S. Lewis thought carefully about the whole idea of praise. And he observed some things just from life. He said, we acknowledge that a good movie or a good book or a good song or a lovely city or a scenic view or a restaurant is deserving of praise if it's good. And he says, we consider admiration to be the correct, adequate, appropriate response to it. And that if we do not admire it, we shall have missed something or lose something. In that way, many objects, both in nature and in art, both deserve to be praised. They demand praise. They merit praise. They merit admiration. So Mont Blanc in the Alps, the city of Paris, Louis Armstrong's version of Wonderful World, the collection of modern art at the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice, the movie Citizen Kane. And it was from this starting point that he began to approach the idea that God himself deserves or demands praise so that we might enter into an appreciation and enjoyment of the universe's greatest good and that none might miss out. I hope that makes sense. It's just a wonderful insight. Much more than that, he realised that 
He is the source of it all, the maker of it all, the one from whom all life and beauty and artistry flows, the one from whom all blessings flow. He says this, he is the object which to admire is simply to be awake, to have entered the real world. And not to appreciate him is to have lost the greatest experience and in the, and in the end to have lost everything. And so he comes to why the psalmists constantly express their praise of God all the time in words. And why do they not just simply enjoy it, but why do they express it out loud? And why do they appeal to others to join with them in praising too? Well, he, he, you know, he, he references um, like Psalm 96, for example, for great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And then also to ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound. Trees, it goes on to talk about everything. Let them all declare praises to the creator, God himself. And um, C.S. Lewis also thought about why people praise things and how they go about it. So he observed how we do this whole business of praising. He thought, well, God knows how we're made. So perhaps by observing our natural human behaviour, it will begin to unlock this conundrum as to why God calls us to praise him. So he observed two further things about how we behave towards each other. Firstly, that all enjoyment in our lives spontaneously overflows into praise. So he says the world rings with praise. Lovers praise their lovers. Readers their favourite poet. Walkers praising the countryside. Players praising their favourite sport or game. Praise of weather, wines, dishes, actors, cars, colleges, countries, children, flowers, mountains, stamps, even sometimes politicians or scholars. That's a natural instinct. Um, for all of us to want to overflow with praise those things which we admire and value and find to be of real worth. Not only do people spontaneously praise but they, what they value, but they, spend, they also spontaneously urge other people to join with them in praising it. You know, he, he just observed that people constantly say, oh, isn't he or isn't she lovely? Wasn't it glorious? Don't you think that is magnificent? And in social media today, it's kind of based on the premise that we share what we like or enjoy with a view that other people might like it or love it or that they too might share it. For me, over the years, it's tended to be, <laughs> it's my family, it's tended to be quite obscure bands or uh, pieces of you know of musicians who, who, I, who I love and get into and, and want to share and want other people to enjoy because it seems to me that if they, if they don't kind of also enjoy something that seems quite obscure that they might miss, that it would be to their loss. So bands like Dry the River, look them up, now defunct but, but were amazing, wonderful, kind of based in, in London, guy, a medical student and some other students as well, just, you know, formed this band, kind of folk and um, indie music. Currently, I really enjoy a band called Low Roar. It's an American guy who did some Americana music. Moved to Iceland and Reykjavik with some other um, Icelandic musicians. Produced a few albums there. It's now based in England. And for us as a family, Rivers and Robots has been a, has been a, um, a, a band that... who are just a, a few guys in Manchester, quite young guys. And they have this ministry in a, in a loft kind of room in... Um, uh, in the city centre of Manchester, and they, they produce um, praise and worship song which is thoughtful and beautiful. And we want to share it, Whoops. Which, which we do at any opportunity. And what, this, what, what C.S. Lewis realised is that the psalmist is telling everyone to praise God because he has discovered that in God is, the, is that object of greatest worth. And he's doing what all people do and what they, what they speak of and what they care about. And he came to this conclusion. He says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses it, but somehow completes the enjoyment. I'll say that again. He says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy 
like the psalmist and like us as Christians. Because the praise not merely expresses that joy, it somehow completes the enjoyment. I felt like new couples um, expressing their love uh, towards each other with the words, I love you. And, and it is, as he said, it is frustrating, I know it is, to have discovered a new author or a new band or, um, and not to be able to tell anyone how good it is. Um, or as he describes, C.S. Lewis describes, suddenly to come to a turn in the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur and then to have to keep silent because the people with you cared nothing for it. No more than a tin can in the ditch. Or to hear a good joke and find no one to share it with. And so to fully enjoy something is not only to fully experience it and to fully express that appreciation, but the joy is made complete in sharing the joy with others so that they might join with you in your appreciation, your joy and your praise. And... Uh, and the psalmists do, which is perfectly natural, when they have discovered the goodness of God. And God encourages us in that. And for me, I can, I can, experience, I, you know, I can relate to that with them. Um, you know, my kind of desire for people to enjoy uh, these bands. So for me, when, when, when I discovered Dry the River um, and shared that with friends in Aberdeen, for me, there was a real sense of joy when I found out that friends had driven from Aberdeen hundreds of miles to go and watch them in a concert. That just seems like an incredible thing. It also is, is great. It, seem, it seems wonderful when um, you know, we hear Rivers and Robots songs appear on Harry and Helena's playlists on their, on their music. You know, that kind of joy is passed on to others and appreciated and valued too. Um, Sam Storms, who's a, um, a charismatic uh, theologian and writer and preacher, um, he says, so Lewis is telling us something about the way God made us. We can't help but praise and rejoice in what we most enjoy. And that enjoyment itself is stunted and hindered if it's never expressed and shared. Tell us also something about God's pursuit of our praise of him is not weak, self-seeking, as though he were vain or insecure, but it's the epitome of self-giving love. If our satisfaction in God is incomplete until it's expressed in praise of him, for satisfying ourselves with him, then God's effort to elicit my worship which C.S. Lewis initially thought was inexcusable selfishness, is both the most loving thing that he could do and the most glorifying thing to him. And Psalm Storm says, praising God completes our joy in him. Now it is so much more, but that just, that, that, that issue of our enjoyment in the Lord in praise is so significant and C.S. Lewis uh, and other saints have helped us um, understand a little bit why God not only encourages us but, um, but commands us to, to take our joy in him. He is the, the most beautiful uh, in all of the universe. As Augustine famously put in a prayer, you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. Some confessions. And uh, Sam Storm was uh, another who was... Um, Hugely influenced by um, C.S. Lewis's chapter in this book, he says, Lewis enabled me to recognise that not only was it permissible to enjoy God in worship, it was absolutely essential if I was to truly honour him. And um, when we praise God, I'm just taking on a, a broader theme here, when we praise God, we are acknowledging and speaking about the most basic truth of all. We are declaring, you are God and I am not. Revelation 4 verse 11 says, you are worthy Lord 
as those who gather around the throne of God say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Praiselessness is not only damaging to us because we don't experience and enjoy the goodness of God, but it's also um, the most profound ingratitude towards God. And it's living in the illusion that we are spiritually self-sufficient in this world. We did not create ourselves. We can't keep our lives going one second without his upholding power. And yet somehow, intuitively, because of sin, we hate that knowledge. Paul says that we repress it. We hate the idea that we are utterly and completely dependent upon God because we would be obligated to him and wouldn't be able to live as we wish. We'd have to defer to the one who gives us everything, says Tim Keller. Psalm 100, verse 3 says, Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. And as the people of God declare, we are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture. Praiselessness is ingratitude towards God. It's, um, it's a delusion uh, which is fed where praiselessness exists in our lives. And it's a dangerous one. And that's why God, for these reasons and many others, that's why God not only deserves our praise, but God demands our praise as a command. The Shorter Catechism says that man's chief end is to glorify God, and to enjoy him forever. But as C.S. Lewis says, that as we glorify him, we come to know that these are the same thing. In commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him. God's inviting us to enjoy him. And this is how God loves sinners like you and me. And how he makes his love made real to us. Without worship, it's not possible for us to enter into the goodness of God. God's desire is our greatest good. And what greater could he give us than himself? And for us to truly enter in, we must embrace him. And to embrace him is to admire him. To admire him is to praise him and to worship him. And so the Jews were commanded in the Old Testament to sacrifice offerings in worship to God. In the New Testament, the Father seeks worshippers who fix their eyes upon Jesus and who admire and adore him. Why? Because God loves us and he wants to, us to enter into his love. And so in the Old Testament, the essence of these sacrifices was not really that they gave bulls and goats to God because he needed them. He didn't need them. But by so doing, God gave himself to us in grace and forgiveness and presence. And in the central act of our worship and communion, there it is manifestly the God who gives himself as we obey his command to worship him and praise him and remember him. We receive, we receive, we receive from God. Why does God command us to praise him? So that he might love us and we might enter into his goodness of love. Praising God is powerful, not to argue, it is life transforming. It's absolutely essential to our spiritual lives. St Augustine says, thinking, arguments and beliefs are crucial as means of moving the heart, but ultimately we are what we adore. We are what captures our imagination, what leads us to praise and to compel others to praise it too. So to focus first on the praise and worship of God as we pray, as we begin our day, gives us a sense of perspective on life, the world, the universe and everything, our own lives too. And uh, in Tim Keller's book, um, when he's talking about the Lord's Prayer, he says Jesus' instruction on prayer, the Lord's Prayer, prayer comes, uh, praise comes first. In, th in that way, praise is primary. Praise motivates the other kinds of prayer. The more we attend to God's perfect holiness and justice and righteousness, the more readily we will see our own flaws and confess them. Seeing God's greatness also leads to supplication. The more we sense his majesty, 
And the more we realise our dependence on him, the more readily we will go to him with every need. The more we say that awe-filled adoration of God corrects and informs all our other kinds of prayers. And that's why he says, prayer, praise and adoration are the necessary preconditions um, and motivation of all other kinds of prayer. This doesn't mean that we can't immediately um, start or pray in other kinds of ways, of course, but it means that in our overall prayer life, Tim Keller argues, prayer and adoration must have a prime place because it sets a perspective. It gives us a way into seeing things the way that they really are. What can re-engineer our very inner being? What can create healthy human community? He says, worship and adoration of God. We must love God supremely and that can be cultivated only through praise and adoration. I don't remember where I wrote these uh, little lines down from, but it came from another article I read this week. Um, speaking about the same thing about reordering our, our world, it says, um, as we praise God, um, it will reorder our universe. It will break the cycle of our thoughts and circumstances to allow us to see things the way that God sees them. It will refocus our minds and our vision from God's perspective. It will relieve our anxieties, refresh our love for him, relax our fears, and renew a right spirit in me. Thank you, Lord. There's, a, there's just a couple of things um, that I just want to say are are um, are helpful to think about what happens as we as we praise God. One is that um, Scripture teaches us that God inhabits the praises of His people. It's an interesting thing to think about. I don't really have time to develop it. I just want to mention it. Uh, and some verses to have a look at. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verse 13. Um, it says this, The trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. In Psalm 22 verse 3, in the ESV it says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. And the King James Version 2000, it says, O you that inhabits the praises of Israel. And I guess that we're aware, many of us, from just... Um, uh, uh, coming to church on Sundays when, do you remember those days? And we used to come to the building together. And um, there is something wonderful and special and particular about gathering together with God's people and praising the Lord together in prayer and in songs of worship. And there is this incredible sense of the Lord um, indwelling and inhabiting the praises of his people. He is with us in a particular way. Now that's not only true of when we gather together in a church building all together. That's also true when you sit with a cup of coffee. Um, and before you start your prayers of um, intercession or prayers for this and prayers for what you need and prayers for what you'd like or prayers for other people and prayers for circumstances, um, start with praise that the Lord might inhabit that place where you are uh, and inhabit your praise um, that you might enjoy the experience of the presence of God himself. There is also spiritual power in praise when we, when we speak out praise to the Lord. It says in Psalm um, 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now think about that for a minute. Now look it up. Psalm 8. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Establishing a stronghold of praise 
against the attacks of the evil one. As we praise the Lord and declare, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. His accusations and lies are silenced as you praise your God. And as C.S. Lewis mentions in his article, there's no experience or skill in praise that is required. No entrance requirement for praise to be good or acceptable. It just needs to be heartfelt and humble. So in this, in this psalm here, it's the praise of children and infants. Which establishes a stronghold against the evil one. And welcomes the presence of the Lord. And as with you, you know, C.S. Lewis mentions love poems written by lovers are often sentimental and simple. And others reading them might think, oh, that's terrible. But, but they express adoration, which is received. And uh, he writes as a, a literary professor. And back in the day he was talking about um, the hymns, ancient and modern. And he says they're often not well written, but we can see that they have glorious truth contained within them and we can praise and adore our wonderful God. And I think that's a great attitude for all of us, really. There's another reason for the primacy of praise. Um, because I think it has power to heal and create an inner spiritual health. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Tim Keller who, who says we can't merely believe in our minds that he is loving or wise or great we must praise him for those things if we are to move beyond an abstract knowledge of God to a heart changing engagement with God learning to praise then changes you and I, I, think, that's, I think that's true that's certainly my experience our, our experience in our house we, we love to sing uh, praise songs, we love to give God thanks and praise and it certainly um, uh, not only creates an atmosphere for God to be at work but it, it brings a healing um, which is which is wonderful um, yeah one of the things that C.S. Lewis noted um, when he was observing people was that the humblest people praised most and the malcontents as he called them praised least he says, the healthy and unaffected person, even if luxuriously brought up and widely experienced in good cookery, could praise a very modest meal. He says, praise almost seems to be inner health made audible. And uh, practice and praise, I think, will improve our spiritual life and our inner spiritual life. So, um, how do we learn to praise God? It's like a tough thing to say almost, but how do we learn to praise God? Um, if some of us find it difficult or awkward, or we've tried to help understand it in its context and, and why it's significant and important and wonderful. Um, but we, at the moment, we look through a glass darkly. There will be a day where we see Jesus face to face and we know that we are known as we are fully known. And our ability to express our appreciation in all kinds of ways and to share it and enjoy it together will be unlimited um, but if we're going to make headway in this uh, work of praise and thanksgiving um, we kind of need to recognise that, that some things work against us so we sit down to uh, give a time of uh, a prayer perhaps in the morning or at some point during the day um, as Tim Keller noted confession and repentance are often driven by circumstances so for example if we fall or fail we're burdened with a sense of guilt and shame so we pray about that fervently Similarly, supplication and intercession are also driven by circumstances. So if a friend or a family member gets an illness or some sort of diagnosis or somebody's job is, is in difficulty or there are so many things that we can, that can draw our attention to pray in that regard, um, we pray fervently for that and that would be right. Um, he says in these cases, prayers are often fueled by the external circumstances and sometimes our sense of helplessness and they fuel uh, those kinds of prayers. And often when good things happen to us or things are going well, you would expect that we, that would provoke even more praise and thanksgiving, but not necessarily the case. Um, 
So we need to remind ourselves, as the psalmist does, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Do not forget his benefits and, and give God thanks and be grateful and express how wonderful he is. He is worthy of our praise. That's something that the psalmist constantly reminds himself to do. Um, Psalm 145, I will extol you, my God. I will bless your name forever and ever. And uh, one of those habits of praise um, from Psalm 145 in that first verse um, has to do with uh, that kind of sense of a lifelong commitment to praise. Um, to being people who are marked by praise every day of our lives, for the whole of our lives and into eternity. Uh, there is, there are, the, the worthiness of God we will never come to an end of. And uh, that expression of, of the psalmist in 145, I will bless your name forever and ever. So I guess that's one habit of praise that we could learn from, just that we understand that we have entered a lifelong commitment of, of praise. In verse 2 it says, every day I will praise you and I will bless your name forever and ever. Daily praise. If it's not part of your, your spiritual habit um, in terms of praise, of prayers of adoration, thanksgiving and praise you know what do we know about God what have we learned about God today that is worthy of praise that is worthy of adoration that is a blessing and we want to say not only thank you Lord but also you are wonderful Lord we want to enter into it make it part of our daily praise also there's the idea of generational praise in this in this psalm here one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts, one generation to another. Declare the praise and goodness of God. And declare it out loud, don't be shy. Whether at home, at church, with friends, to the ends of the earth. Speak, I will speak of your awesome acts, I will declare your greatness, Lord. You're worthy of praise. And just finally, just the last minute, C.S. Lewis, in his book Letters to Malcolm, he, um, he has this spiritual habit of um, which he describes turning every pleasure into a channel of adoration. Um, things as diverse as a mountain view, a great book, a piece of music. You know, he says, gratitude exclaims, how good of God to give me this. <laughs> To be able to enjoy this. How good of God to be able to give me this. Adoration says, what kind of God gives me this? What kind of God is behind this mountain view? This, the genius of this good book. The wonderful harmony of this piece of music. What kind of God? And he says this beautiful little phrase. Let your mind run back up the sunbeam to the sun. We experience the sunbeam. We enjoy its goodness. Don't take it for granted. Say thank you. But let your mind run back up the sunbeam to God and ask the question, what kind of God gives these incredible gifts and goodness? And he says, we shall not become able to adore God on the highest occasions if we've not learned the habit of doing so on the everyday occasions. And then eventually... You'll find yourself praying instinctively by focusing on God and his character and his wonder and his beauty and his blessings and his gifts. And you'll thank him and adore him and praise him before everything else. And that's what it means to praise his name. Amen.